seats. There any more seats? Do you want me to start? Do you want me to start? Yes, it's two minutes past. Yeah. Any time you want to. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see your attendance. Thank you all for coming out this evening to what uh, I anticipate will be a very informative evening for everybody. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, apologies for running out of seats. The evening is recorded and it will be available for public in about two, three days. So if anyone misses out on anything, um, there will be the full video recording and audio available coming out in the not too distant future. Um, toilets. We have uh, restrooms directly uh, at the back wall there and also in the entrance foyer as you came in on the right hand side. We have the exit doors there as well as the exit doors here and also through out in the, the back room. Um, so again thank you all for attending and coming along this evening to this informative presentation and guest speakers. <coughs> First question I'd like to ask this evening is who here has suffered inundation, flooding or catastrophe from climate change in the last five years? <laughs> <laughs> no hands up. Uh, well, you're not alone in being concerned about what's happening in our region. Oh, sorry. My name is Dean, and I'm your MC for this evening. Um, I actually don't live in the area, but I have done in the past in the Kapiti Coast, and I'm as concerned about what's going on as you all are. Uh, and you're not alone in being concerned. There are a number of organisations around the country and abroad that are pushing back against council overreach, a number of organisations as CALM and CRU, which are your local organisations, but also challenging councils NZ, City Watch, and exposing Hamilton City, along with New Zealand councils, the good, the bad and the ugly. And uh, I'm a, I'm a, I view all of these organisations and I can tell you there's a lot of nefarious activity going on around New Zealand. But also, not in New Zealand, but also in Australia, where they're identifying uh, adaption plan and what they call managed retreat in Australia as well. So what we're seeing here in New Zealand, we are not alone. There's also such a term, as I've recently read, called an insurance retreat. That is something that we all need to be extremely concerned about because that will have a profound effect on the sale of your property should you be identified as being a property in a hazard zone in this region. As we all know, you need insurance in order for a bank to grant a mortgage to someone who wishes to buy your property should you wish to sell. And if your property is identified on a limb report, that could have some very adverse effects, not only to your premiums, but to the saleability of your property. Something to bear in mind. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker for this evening. CALM is a local advocacy group made up of residents and businesses and owners who are concerned about the process modelling and science being used in the coastal adaption areas for the Kapiti Coast. CALM, the CALM Alarmist Law Madness, was established to become a voice of reason amidst 
an alarmist process which could see our community disintegrate before our very eyes if we don't take action now. I'll speak a little bit more on that uh, at the end of this presentation, but at, uh, right now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Tanya from Khan. A big welcome to Tanya. Good evening everybody and it's fantastic to see such a good turnout tonight. Thank you so much for coming. This is a really important meeting. Uh, we wish that we weren't the ones who would have to call this, but unfortunately due to the council uh, kind of keeping things under wraps a little bit, we've had to take the reins and let people know what's happening here in Kapiti. So to start things off, um, CALM actually was born out of the Raumati community meeting, which you may have heard about. That was the one where Mr Bolger was present. Um, so we formed pretty quickly after that. And uh, a lot of people there weren't aware of what was actually happening with the properties. It's still sort of like hidden in plain sight. So you have to know about the Takatai Kapiti website to be able to go on it and see what's happening. Uh, so, who we are. As Dean said, we are a grassroots group of residents and business owners who are concerned about the process that's going on at the moment with CAP. Now CAP stands for Coastal Advisory Panel, that's the one that's headed by Mr Bolger. Um, they have a panel, um, some of them we have never seen, <laughs> um, but to their credit, just lately, some of the CAP uh, people have been turning up and we're, we're very happy about that. They've, they've been showing up at meetings that the Raumati Community Board have asked them to speak at. So full credit to the Raumati Community Board as well. Um, the Chair, Big Laracy, um, is very good at uh, keeping things transparent so that we know what's going on um, and last Wednesday and Thursday night, there were a couple of meetings on consecutive nights where we were able to ask questions. And I think that's really good for our community to be able to ask questions. Um, so we are pushing back against extreme sea level rise modelling, which gives extreme results on potential, not real events. Now I know it gets, it's not the most interesting of subjects to be talking about tonight, and we'll be talking about things like RCP 8.5H+, which is at the very extreme end of the modelling that's going on. Now, if they use 4.5, we wouldn't be in this situation. Right, so um, the Council formed the Coastal Advisory Panel in 2020 to work through the process and report back to the Council in May 2024. So that's May this year. 2022. Uh, Originally it was meant to be 2022. Was it? Yes. Right. Yeah. Well that's interesting. So we've been given an, an extra two years. We've got a very narrow window of opportunity here. Um, so they are using the Jacobs report, which includes extreme and implausible modelling, which is what I've just been speaking about with the formula that they're using. Um, there are five coastal adaptation areas which have been identified right down the coast. Um, and the first one that was completed was the northern one, which was Otaki, Tihoro, and Pika Pika. Now, already from that, 1,100 homes have been identified for managed retreat. Now, these, these owners have no idea. They don't know this is even happening. We don't know, we don't even know how to find out because we would go door knocking if we could to let these people know. Lim reports have actually um, had notations go on them as well. All of, our, all of our Lim reports have had these notations, these hazard warnings. There was no consultation, um, huge worry. They mentioned the Jacobs report on them. Um, we also feel that CAP's engagement has been flawed due to a lack of effective notification of community meetings. Um, they called one in Ota Otahanga, which I think had about 
30 people turn up, um, one in Otaki which had only 20 people turn up because it's not advertised widely. You would have to know what you're looking for. Um, so at the recent Raumati Community Board uh, meeting, which CAP came to last week, uh, they repeatedly emphasised that they are not accountable for council decisions. This is a huge worry. So who is responsible? Because uh, how it works is that we have the technical advisory group. They provide um, advice to CAP, who then present their findings to um, the council. Um, so it's a conflict of interest because you've got a couple of people currently from the council who are on the technical advisory group panel. So it's just like a kind of insidious circle, huge conflict of interest. Um, if the council adopts the recommendations, which we view as unfair and predetermined, then it's the council, not CAP, responsible for any hazards on our limbs. CAP insists on using implausible factors affecting most capital ratepayers. So we will all be affected, um, even if you're not right on the coast. If you're two kilometres back, that's how far it stretches in places. It goes right back to the old main road. So that encompasses a huge amount of properties. Um, so you don't have to be right by the sea for, the, for it to become a problem. Um, you could be near what, a flooding plain or an inundation area, ponding, anything like that. So it is a huge worry for us all. Um, so the council might shift responsibilities citing adherence to CAP's recommendations. Uh, insurance companies may argue negligence for not considering hazards on limbs, absolving themselves of cost increases or property devaluations. So I think we all know that if we can't get insurance on our properties, uh, the banks won't let you take out a mortgage, so there will be defaults. Um, we're already in a cost of living crisis right now. Um, the rates are going up as well, so we're in a pretty bad situation right now. Um, overall, capital ratepayers have spent over $3 million in costs for a process that no one is taking responsibility for, which potentially will lead to significant losses per household. The beneficiaries are scientists, bureaucrats, and the insurance companies. It's imperative to unite and send a strong message that we hold CAP and councillors personally accountable. And it's good to see that we've got at least one here tonight. <laughs> well, um, we are being filmed tonight, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, I'll come to that. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so this just shows the, um, the responsibility kind of, hey, it's not us, it's them. Well, no, it's not us, it's, it's them. So, um, yeah, it just becomes a cycle. Um, this is all on our website, so we don't expect you to look at this right now, but this is how much has been spent on, um, on the council, on the CAP um, process to date. This takes us up to the end of June 2023. Um, and already at this time, it was past the $3 million mark. So that gives you some idea of what the ratepayers are actually paying for. Ratepayers are not only paying for the cost of this process, $3 million plus, there will be more financial implications. So the cost of managed retreat. The current value of the 1,000 plus homes already identified, that's the 1,100 homes that are in the northern adaptation zone um, is substantial. That's 1,100 homes. Um, the compensation cost could be even more substantial because the cap process is not complete. The compensation offered to property owners could be reduced if homes are significantly devalued. Uh, so the cost. This will apply to any natural hazard, for example, flooding, slips, storm surge, and erosion, which would encompass, 
most properties in Kapiti. So as I said before, you don't have to live right on the coast. Um, even if the coastal adaptation areas are not directly placed on limbs, this process will inform insurance companies of a potential hazard and create the same sad outcome. Currently, all newly issued limbs contain the following wording and refer to a report by Jacobs, which will specify that your property is in a CAA hazard zone, which indirectly achieves the same outcome. So what it says is, for anyone who can't read it, coastal erosion and inundation hazards. Council holds a set of reports prepared by Environmental Engineering Consultancy, Jacobs New Zealand Limited, covering susceptibility and vulnerability assessments of the coastal areas of the district based on a range of sea level rise scenarios, remembering that the, the most extreme one is RCP 8.5 H+, um, over periods of 30, 50 and 100 years. The Council intends using these reports to inform future district plan work which will consider any necessary changes to land use and subdivision controls in areas which may be affected. So to my knowledge, we've all got these on our limbs. We've all got this notation. We've even found properties in Kotari Street, which is way up high. That's way past the old main road. So it seems to be just a blanket covering of, um, of properties. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so yeah, just hold on to that question. Um, so who benefits? The consultants, the scientists, and local central government. The extreme modelling creates an exaggerated coastal adaptation area, which, as I said, captures many residents in a hazard zone up to two kilometres back. So the Jacobs report uses the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the RCP, SSP, so SSP is sort of like the new version of RCP, um, 8.5 H plus modelling. Um, the H plus model is not used anywhere in the world. So even the IPCC has said that it's implausible. So it is really important for us to have this dropped because that is what's going to lead to managed retreat and people having to leave their homes. So we're not trying to be doomsday. We're just responding to what council has already done. And we have a ticking clock here with a small window of opportunity to stop this train. Um, so the modelling, which appears in the Jacobs report, appears to exclude seawalls and natural barriers. So really, they should have taken those into consideration because we do have seawalls. Uh, the modelling is based on a high-energy rocky shoreline, but we in Kapiti actually have a sandy coastline, um, and we also have unique ge geological features of Kapiti's coastline, um, which is an accreting coastline, and the land mass is rising. That didn't appear in the Jacobs report. Barry Burrell recently wrote an article titled RCP 8.5, A Recipe for Endless Waste. Um, this is a must read as it gives a comprehensive insight into why we are so focused on stopping the use of extreme modelling. So I think when I'm speaking in front of community boards, and we, we've been to a lot lately, um, they are so sick of us talking about RCP 8.5 but it is incredibly controversial and we know of a lot of scientists that do not endorse it being used. So um, this again, um, this article by Barry Brill is on our website. Um, so we encourage you to read it for yourself. It's a, it's a great read. Um, so here's a snippet here. The great majority of the ministry's false prophecies are based on a single imagined storyline, RCP 8.5 an obsolete 15-year-old scenario which is now almost universally recognised as being highly unlikely, if not wholly impossible. Its probability distribution is about 1%. RCP 8.5 rests on assumptions that global emissions are sharply increasing, that no country anywhere has ever or will ever adopt a climate policy that the world's population will double and that coal power will be dominant by 2100. All this is plainly nonsense. 
Uh, so our concerns, KCDC and CAP have failed to raise sufficient awareness for community engagement. As I said, it was uh, poor um, attendance rates. Who here knew about the, um, the meetings that were on in Otaki and Otahanga? Did anybody actually know? No. So we, we've got, maybe I could count them on one hand. So really that's not good enough because this, this affects people's properties. There were more than 30 people in the central area. There were, the most of them are voting clubs were packed. I think that a lot of them were actually top heavy. I think a lot of them were council staff because we had people in there who recognised a lot of them. They were also sitting at the tables as well, um, which would have led to false readings. There were more than 30 public, well, 30 public people. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that most of them were staff members. Well, yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we can hold discussions we, until a little bit later, we'll be great. We'll have a Q&A. We, we will we have a Q&A. Was run, Q &A. Similarly to your Ramadji one, it was advertised in the local reg, and it was well attended. I'm not just picking up for anything, but no, just I, so you're not your... Uh, just a little bit about yeah, the Oji Hunger, I went to Oji Hunger and the one around Matthew. Okay, you were one of the lucky few then, um, because most of us probably don't even get a paper. I know that I don't. I might get one. Yeah. Um, so the Round Matty Community Workshop in July 2023 saw a large representation of residents, around 200. Um, challenge CAP science and process, which then prompted KCDC to limit Paikokariki workshop attendees to no more than 60 people, um, and that was registration only. So you had to register to go along to that meeting. Uh, so if you were recognised, probably like me, as a bit of a stirrer, um, what would have been my chances if I'd owned a property in Paikok of actually going to that meeting? Probably nil. So, incredibly unfair. And security was on the door. Yes, they were. There was at least one security guard there. I spoke with the chief executive and I could see people coming out of the meeting and I said, well, that's great. Maybe I can go in now. He said, you can. And it's like, great. So I went to walk in the door and it's like, if you register. I was like, come on, come on, Darren. Um, that's just bureaucracy at its worst, you know. You need to make these meetings available for everybody. And our meeting tonight was for everybody in the community. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a council member, a councillor, who we're really happy to see, by the way. Um, it was open to everybody. Um, at every workshop, a conflict of interest occurred, as I said, when KCDC CAP staff participated at the tables. The process is easily corruptible as every view is given equal attention. So one opinion would have the same weighting as that of the majority of participants, which will skew results in reports. So if you had 10 people at a table and nine said, I don't, I don't like what you're proposing, it, it doesn't sound good to me, I don't particularly want to go down the road of managed retreat or, you know, uh, but one person said, well, I, I like it personally. Um, that person's um, point of view, that, that one person, would be put up on a board and had the same weight as the nine who said, no, I don't actually like it. Um, the four basic <laughs> workshop questions are designed to give an outcome that CAP wants, not what the community want. Many felt they were being pushed to a tokenistic, predetermined outcome. Um, now this, this is by Catherine Moody, who is a senior tutor at Massey for Humanities and Social Sciences. This is on our website, so you, you can read that. But it looks like what council were using was a method called the Delphi method, uh, which was to gain a consensus. So if you look that up, um, yeah, that's what they were using. Uh, CAP, KCDC are not listening to the community. It has been repeatedly pointed out to CAP and KCDC by many ratepayers and Coastal Ratepayers United crew who, let me say, have done a fantastic job over the years. I just want to give credit to crew and to Salima for the fantastic, they've been doing, fantastic work they've been doing since at least 2010, 2011, they've taken council to court. They've actually stopped the limb reports um, being altered 
So you know, if you're not a member of Crew, I would definitely suggest that you sign up. And sign up to Calm as well while you're at it. Um, so over several years, that the science is flawed at best and misleading at worst. Unfortunately, to date, KCDC and CAP have not satisfactorily answered these concerns. Crew, with 500 members, have stated that they n have no confidence in the CAP process. Um, to date, CAP have not had their technical people available at community meetings to answer questions. I mean, last week, um, and I, I do want to give full credit to the four members who turned up, Kelvin Nixon, Don Day, Susie Mills, and the scientist Martin Manning. They did front up. It's not an easy job for them to do, to front up to um, people who aren't particularly happy about what they're proposing. But they did it. So, you know, full credit to them there. Um, CAP are due to report back in May 2024. You can never say that too many times. Um, time is running out for KCDC to respond appropriately to the community and for the community to take action. So we all need to join forces. Um, what we're asking is that there are flyers on the table over there. If everyone is able to take one, um, give one or, you know, if you can take a picture of it with your um, phone, send it to 10 people. Uh, sounds like a chain letter. Um, but if you can give it to family, friends, neighbours, because there are a lot of people who don't even know that this process is going on. Um, both CAP and council members' decisions have the potential to affect you when the recommendations go before council. So uh, they will increase your insurance premiums or limit the ability to obtain insurance. So I mean, what chance do our children and grandchildren have in the future? Um, they will reduce the value of your home due to a potential hazard on your limb. We know that the real estate agents are already talking about this in Capity. Um, it will affect your mortgage and bank lending. Now, I've, I've worked in a bank. Um, I know how they work. I worked in mortgage finance. And if your house is not insured, you will not get a mortgage. And I don't think it's changed since I was there then. Um, so some existing mortgages could be vulnerable for recall by banks if property values fall below the outstanding debt. Worst case scenario is loss of your property via managed retreat. So what managed retreat means, for the gentleman who asked, um, is that if your property has been identified as in a zone which is going to be affected, and we're using RCP 8.5 here, uh, you will no longer receive insurance on your property and that will affect your mortgage. Um, and I know a lot of people because they've said it to me, that's okay, I'm prepared to stay here, I've paid off my mortgage, I'll take my chances. It's not quite that simple because I've seen an expert working group report which is just a draft, um, so I don't really want to quote it too much, but the way they're thinking is that they will withdraw council services to your property, that sewerage, water, um, and then if you still say, that's okay, I can live with that, um, they, they would probably have emergency powers which would forcibly remove you. So I'm thinking the way that things have been happening in the press lately, that might be a road that they go down. We don't want to find out. Um, so our community will be torn apart by this if it goes through. We, we can't take that risk. Uh, managed retreat, there is an in inexplicable push for predetermined out alarming outcomes. So as we've already said, 1,100 homes, it's been all over the, the press. Um, if you uh, look up managed retreat, you'll find so much information about it. It's not only happening in New Zealand, it's happening all around the world as well. And we, um, we have an alliance with somebody in Australia. They are going through exactly the same thing over there. So we've kind of joined forces to, um, to fight this because the more information you have, the, the better the fight. Um, here are a few of the, um, so we already know that insurance companies such as AIG are, um, 
are making it hard for people. And I do know personally of people whose insurance has gone up way over 30% on what it was last year. So, so it is really important that we get rid of the hazard notices of our limb reports and that we fight this RCP 8.5 and make it a reasonable outcome for everybody. Coastal adaptation areas, this is the main concern we have because it's so extensive and encapsulates most Kapiti residents. We can clearly see that the extensive coastal adaptation areas are nonsense. So as I, as I was saying before, managed retreat will affect fewer people, but coastal adaptation areas um, will affect mainly all of us. You can see from this map here, and it's kind of quite misleading because it goes all the way back to Mount Holdsworth. <laughs> so it looks like it's a very small area here, but we've actually done an enlargement to show you. You can see where the old main road is. Um, so it's that whole area there. Now this map is also on our website, so you, you can look at that at your leisure. The following graph shows that in 100 years, the modelled sea level rise using the latest IPCC RCP 4.5 is only 0 0.8 metres. The effects of this can be mitigate, mitigated without placing massive financial and social burden on the region. This shows here, you can see the red line is the 8.5 scenario. Uh, so the, the red one is actually the um, H+, plus, which is the more extreme one out of the two RCP 8.5s. Now, if we were looking at RCP 4.5, we probably wouldn't even be sitting here. So what we want is plausible science. We want to use modelling that accounts for solid protection barriers, such as seawalls, rocks, and natural barriers. Updated IPCC data using likely scenarios and factors for Sandy Beach, not high energy rocky shoreline, which Jacobs have used in their report. Um, use of wider scientific views, data for balance, for example, Capiti's accreting coastline and rising landmass, as we've said before. We want to remove the coastal adaptation zones which could cause financial, psycho psychological, social and community stress. We want to mitigate, maintain, adapt, build infrastructure as necessary with the least cost and most benefit solutions, for example, seawalls to account for plausible risks. We want genuine, transparent community engagement and feedback. We want re-engagement with the community for the central and northern Kapiti areas as they were not properly notified. We want accountability and, accountability and responsibility from our elected and salaried council officials, community boards and CAP members. This must include listening to the community's concerns in a respectful and impartial manner because there is no community confidence in this CAP process. We want a true democratic process that is direct and transparent, including in-person community meetings, not online, and timely feedback to the community. We should have a voice and a vote in the pathway that is put before the council. Even a referendum where everybody gets to vote, where everyone gets to have a voice. We want urgent removal of the mapped coastal hazard areas, that's um, the coastal adaptation areas from all council and CAP reports. These are not statutory compliant and should not be used for planning purposes. We want urgent removal of any reference to the Jacobs report on capity property limbs. A reference to Jacobs has been placed on all limbs without consultation and voting by councillors, which suggests a predetermined outcome. So in summary, Takatai Kapiti Cap have created a solution and looked for a problem. They have cherry-picked the science for a predetermined outcome, and of that science, they have used extreme and plausible scenarios as a starting point. So this is the handout that we received at the meetings on Wednesday and Thursday at the Raumati Community Boards. So they very casually put on the cover here 
Long-term plans have to allow for losing some of the land that currently contains houses, roads and other infrastructure. So casual. <laughs> um, and a few pages in, there is also mentions such as managed retreat is being discussed much more widely. So they're trying to warm us up for uh, managed retreat. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, spread the calm message to as many people as possible. Lobby councillors, and we have two here tonight. Um, the mayor, local MP government. We've actually, uh, with the handout that we've got on the table over there, we've got all the uh, contact details for the councillors, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I can also tell you that um, the council person who deals with limb reports has been on leave. I'm not sure if he's back yet, and I'm not sure if the leave has got anything to do with it. Stress leave, maybe? I don't know. Um, his name is James Jefferson, so I would start contacting him because Having limb notations, um, which you were not consulted on, is not cool. Um, we need to attend more council and community meetings. I know they're not the most exciting things to go to, but I think when your property or your business or both is, is in jeopardy, I think we need to have, make it our business to go along there. Sign the competition that we have on our website. Follow, engage with us on Facebook. Um, and keep up to date through our website or join our emailing list um, and we've got the contact details there. Um, so just to summarise, um, yeah, we, we've got an extremely small um, window now where we all have to join together. We have to put the pressure on council. We need to make people responsible for, the, for what's happening right now because really the, um, the end result is quite unimaginable. Thank you so much for listening. Well done. How was that? Informative? Yep. Okay. A lot of the stuff that was presented in that presentation you can actually Google and have a look. Someone asked about managed retreat. So I had a little Google, and here's what I came up with. To address the unprecedented challenge, the government proposed a new piece of legislation in 2020 called Climate Adaption Act. This act is intended to address the complex and distinctive issues associated with managed retreat, such as funding, compensation, land, acquisition, liability, and insurance. So there's a few things to be read out of that. Insurance, NZI brand, uh, AMI and state as part of AIG have also said that they would be looking at areas associated with coastal adaption and what the implications would be and this is part of what they term insurance retreat. So you've got a number of severe implications and it's up to you to address it in your area and also to get as many people as you know to address the issue as well because there is no going back from this once it starts and it's up to us all now to put it to rest. Um, Interestingly about, uh, and before I introduce the next piece, I'd just like to mention about uh, one, one area that I know of, Waitareri Beach. They've just built a new uh, surf life uh, saving uh, club room on the front sand hill, which is around about 40 to 50 metres ahead of the previous sand hill that was the closest sand hill to the beach. There was also a shipwreck there called the Hyderabad that I remember climbing on as a young lad. And that uh, bow was about three metres above the ground and the high tide, you couldn't get to that shipwreck. You could drive the high tide mark between the sand hill and the high tide and the shipwreck was further out to sea, maybe 
10, 15, 20 metres or so. You can also look up the Hydra Band and see the series of photos since 1974 of the shipwreck in a three metre bow sticking out of the sand and the sand dunes about 50 metres behind it. Right now you can't find the Hydra Band because the sand hills have encroached past it by approximately 50 metres. So inundation, sea level rise, we have a land mass that is encroaching out to sea, ladies and gentlemen, and that you can see with your very eyes. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Andy Oakley. As a national manager within one of the country's largest mechanical companies, his skills include factory management, sales engineering, sales management, project management. He's a published author of several books, as well as being co-founder of Hobson's Pledge. And his video, Flawed Coastal Adaption Projects, Why Modelling Should Not Drive Policy, is an interesting observation into what is happening in Kapiti right now. Enjoy. Welcome to my presentation, Flawed Coastal Adaptation Projects, Why Modelling Should Not Drive Policy. So our agenda today is, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an in introduction. We'll talk about the Kapiti Coast Advisory Panel, the District Council, the Government, the IPCC and Insurance Council. We're going to talk about uh, Professor John R. Christie uh, and empirical data versus predictions. And then I'll summarise. This will take about 20 minutes or so. Firstly, I'd like to discuss the coastal adaptation projects currently underway in New Zealand. A term likely encompasses similar initiatives globally. My aim is to shed light on the impulsive actions of our local council, the Kapiti District Council, during this process and to uncover the true motivations behind these initiatives. The core concept driving most coastal adaptation projects is the belief that escalating levels of CO2 are causing a rise in Earth's average temperatures, consequently leading to climate change. We are informed that this will manifest as wetter, hotter and more severe storms. These pr predictions are derived from climate change models, which project that the increase in greenhouse gas CO2 emissions in Earth's atmosphere will elevate global average temperatures thereby causing climate change. The primary focus of these projects is on the potential impact of higher temperatures, which could result in the melting of landlocked ice and subsequently raise sea levels. This in turn could pose a more significant and frequent threat of damage to residences and infrastructure located in close proximity to the sea. In Kapiti, a coastal advisory panel known as CAP has been established with millions of ratepayer dollars allocated to fund this initiative. Similarly, in other regions of the country, these projects are also incurring huge costs for the local ratepayers. However, many uh, residents in these areas disagree with their council's actions. This disagreement largely stems from the council's creation of what are termed hazard zones. There is concern that these zones may be marked with hazard notices on the land information memorandum or the LIM reports for properties that are believed to be at risk in the future, including houses located up to two kilometres from the coast. Now notice the phrase I used before, to be at risk in the future. This implies a belief in the ability of these advisory panels to predict future events. Now, while it's conceivable that small aspects of the future can be forecasted based on historical data, that's not the approach being taken here. Instead, the councils have sought guidance from the New Zealand government, which is, advises that although councils are not obliged to do anything at all, they are encouraged to do so. And if they choose to use data for decision making or policy implementation, the AR6 IPCC computer models represent the best source of this data. 
And you can see here with the coastal, uh, Kapiti Coastal Advisory Panel, central to the processes are community engagement. Now you would expect them to listen to the community during these uh, engagement meetings. Uh, my information is they're not. On the right, we have an image illustrating the IPCC's 1995 theory of climate change, known as the greenhouse effect. And on the left, there's a graph displaying temperature records from weather stations dating back to 1850. The IPCC has selected the year 1850 as the starting point for this data because they believe that when he, that's when human activities began significantly increasing atmosphere CO2 levels. Now the Earth's average temperature hovers around 14 or 15 degrees Celsius and the graph on the left depicts years that were cooler or warmer than this average. They focus on what appears to be an increase in temperatures of about 1.5 degrees over 174 uh, years and project this rise out into the future in an attempt to alarm the population. The two images appear to support the council's concern and so validating their alarm and decision to seek advice from the government and engage the community in discussions about appropriate actions. However, it's important to remember that, the, that this remains a theory. Neither the IPCC nor any government or district council can provide concrete proof that this theory is unequivocally correct. Instead, they have relied on the climate change models to predict future outcomes if, if this theory proves to be accurate. We just look at this, uh, a quick explanation of this, um, the greenhouse effect here, the sun radiates energy into the earth and apparently this layer of greenhouse gases here, um, uh, as the CO2 rises, traps in heat, that's, that's their theory. And on this side, uh, this is the mean, or the, sorry, the average temperature line here. And these are the years that were below average and these are the years above. Then there's a for approximately one to one and a half degree rise over this 174 years. That's what the alarm is all about. So let's have a look at the IPCC AR6. The government advises district councils to align with the global consensus of the IPCC, effectively sidelining any uh, theories or data that diverge from this consensus. Moreover, the government has recommended that councils consider the worst case scenarios, such as SSP or uh, better known as RCP 8.5 in their planning. In Capity, they have commissioned a report based on these worst case scenarios. It's evident that the IPC, the, uh, it's evident that the IPC, many scientists, the government, and consequently the council subscribe to the belief it's, it's a belief system that they have that CO2 is the primary driver of Earth's atmospheric temperature. This perspective leads them to focus exclusively on the data from models that correlate temperature increases with rising levels of CO2. In adopting this approach, they are disregarding alternative theories, of which there are many that challenge this nar narrative. In essence, they are prioritizing consensus over broader scientific exploration, which is contrary to the fundamental principles of scientific inquiry. If I just grab that highlighter, and here we see the global temperature average. The council are, at the IPCC, the councils and the government are saying, use this highest line here. Look at the um, the, all the models range here, and they are preparing information in these coastal advisory panels using these highest temperature gauge uh, changes. The um, land precipitation, rainfall, again, look at the wide uh, ranging models, but they're wanting to use the highest one. In terms of the Arctic sea ice, notice they don't have the Antarctic sea ice on this because that's actually growing, which we'll see in a, a moment, but they want the lowest one. And again, 
the mean sea le uh, level ch change. They want to use these highest ones. This is to implement policy um, in the Kapiti regions and every other region will be the same, no doubt. However, this approach focusing solely on the temperature rise since 1850 and then correlating it with increasing CO2 levels is intentionally misleading. It gives a skewed perspective to those who don't have the time to conduct their own research. By extending our view to encompassing data from the past 400,000 years, we gain a much clearer understanding. First, the pattern observed in the last 170 years as depicted, as depicted in their graph is not unique. Similar patterns have emerged at least four times in the last 400,000 years. And here we see them here, the current one, here about 100,000 years ago, here another 100,000 years ago, and here. The, these have happened many times. And what we're seeing in this graph here, well, if I just read the slide here, the second, well, there appears to be a correlation between CO level, CO2 levels and temperature. The data consistently shows that temperature rises precede increases in CO2. There's an approximate 800 year lag between these events. Now this alone casts significant doubt on the IPCC's theory regarding greenhouse uh, effects. What I was gonna mention here is this 170 year one and a half degree rise as measured from weather stations, which can move about and change from urban to rural settings, so, sorry, the other way around, from rural to urban settings, is just the last little part of this full graph here. The empirical long-term data from the past contradicts their predictions for the future. In today's context, in the past 600 million years, we've observed uh, exceptionally high CO2 levels during the Cambrian period, when this is this period here, uh, when multicellular life thrived. Throughout Earth's history, we've encountered high CO2 levels in ice ages, uh, that's here, relatively high CO2 and low temperatures. Uh, the, the range of CO2 concentration spans everything in between. Sorry, I was, I was going to say as well as low levels of CO2 during similar periods. So we've had high levels of CO2 during ice ages and low periods. The range of CO2 concentration spans everything in between. What becomes immediately apparent is over the long term, there has been a consistent abundance of CO2 alongside some of the lowest temperatures the Earth has experienced there appears to be little or no correlation over the long term. And if we see down here, here's where we are today. We have very low CO2 by the standard set in the long term past. However, while I can present scientific data that raises serious questions about the Council's use of ratepayer funds, I must clarify that I am not a qualified scientist. Nevertheless, I believe one of the most compelling pieces of evidence I could put before you comes from to the 2015 US Senate hearing on climate change, which features testimony from John R. Christie. Christie is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. He has also served as lead author for the United Nations IPCC. Christie's te testimony, uh, testimony, testimony before the US House Committee on Natural, Source, uh, Natural Resources is particularly valuable. This committee oversees legislation and conducts con congressional oversight on all matters within its jurisdic uh, jurisdiction, including the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The significance of Christie's empirical data lies in the fact that it underwent rigorous scrutiny within this legislative body. His contributions were not mere predictions from a computer model, but were grounded in empirical observations and analysis. The following slides are from his presentation. 
As it was 2015, and these climate models had been running since 1988, Christie could measure the predictions made in the models with the observed empirical data. The predictions in this graph, uh, that's the red, orange, and yellow lines, uh, were under they underestimated the rise in CO2 by quite some margin, meaning the red, yellow, the red and yellow prediction lines would have been even further away from the empirical uh, blue lines. So this is the um, observations from dating back from or from 2015 back to uh, 1988, and you can see they're quite different from those early uh, predictions. In 2015, after they had adjusted their models, Christie ran another comparison between models predictions and the empirical data. He found of 102 model runs and comparisons in the 32 groupings, none were even close, not one. It's clear, uh, sorry, it's clear then that these people and their models make no coherent predictions that fit with reality and that the consensus science they are using is flawed. As Christie says uh, down, down here, if you can't predict a system, then you do not understand it. Sorry, I've, I've skipped over a slide there. And I can't go back, but never mind. This is a, um, a clearer view of that. This is the average of the IPCC climate models, and here is the observations. And you can see that from you know 2010, or if you look at 2015, this is, this is the temperature rise from average here. It's about 0.2, very similar in the 1990s. Not much is happening at all. The Northern Hemisphere uh, snow extent. Here we see the record uh, is 2012-13. So there's no trend here. It's not getting warmer. Um, that's not what this data shows. Global hurricanes and tropical cyclones. Again, practically no, nothing shown uh, any different. If anything, it's moving down or staying the same. Nothing to see there. The uh, sea ice. The Arctic ice uh, is going down. Um, there it is there. I think it's uh, going down by about five kilometers a day. But at the same time, the Arctic ice is going up by 10 kilometers a day. So the uh, ice shelves around the world are remaining the same. Monthly fraction of US with very wet uh, floods or very dry drought conditions. Uh, we're looking for trends here. There's not much trends there. Look, there's some peaks uh, way higher uh, many years ago uh, than what we're at here. So we're either the same or it's going down. Global drought indices from 1982 to 2012. Again, we're looking for trends. There's no trends here. If anything, it's the same or reducing. Uh, the average of four 100 mile diameter regions centered on these areas here between 1883 and 2014. Again, we're looking for trends. Uh, uh, is it going up? Uh, we can't see it going up. I think, if anything, it's the same or reducing. Fractions of daily high temperatures um, exceeding 100 degrees east. Uh, so these are daily highs of 100. Uh, Fahrenheit, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. Again, and we're looking for um, any trends. If anything, it's the same or going down. So Christie's data was accepted and he won his case, i.e. they could not falsify the empirical data that he put before them. And while his testimony changed much of the public's opinion, because the uh, IPCC policy advisors refused Used to budge from the consensus science, uh, the consensus that many scientists have come to, climate change polarization continues today. I've put together here some um, 
a photograph from 1965 of the Kapiti Coast, Waikanae Beach area, and I went to Google Earth and got something um, from a similar angle. The, 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 the magnification is not exactly the same, but when I measure the road here and here, and then I measure the distance to the sea, if anything, it's exactly the same. No movement in 56 years. And I would say in this area here, there's actually more land, uh, more grassland than there was in 1965. One more of those slides. This one was looking the other way from 1969 and 2021. Again, there is no appreciable difference in if anything, uh, this grass area down here, uh, there's more land here. This is sand. Um, and if you just look at this area here and this, this area of grass down here, if anything, uh, 52 years later, there's more land. And so to summarize, Christie's data is crystal clear. Using computer models for predicting climate is flawed, or predicting future climate is flawed, and scientists worldwide agree. What's happening here seems like a mix of authoritarianism and corporate greed, especially from insurance companies. The council's role should be building essential infrastructure like seawalls and drainage systems, not blindly following the insurance council's warning about rising premiums based on speculative climate change theories. And the New Zealand government's role should be to guide councils away from getting tangled in climate change debates. Scientists clearly don't have a grasp on predicting the future climate, so the focus should be on providing communities with the infrastructure that they need right now. Concerns arising about the IPCC's effectiveness, seen as potentially biased due to funding from major corporations, some of which are tied to insurance companies. We need a close look to ensure unbiased and accurate information in Capity. In Capity meetings, sorry, I'll start that again. In Capity, meetings reveal the Insurance Council's reps dominating conversations with gloomy forecasts based on shaky IPCC predictions. This drives the narrative of soaring insurance premiums. They're preparing you for it. Capity res residents must clearly tell the councils that they oppose hazard zone designations and demand their concerns, especially about exaggerated weather threats be heard. Remember, it's the residents who the council should serve. They shouldn't have to foot the bill for poorly thought out ideas, ridiculous insurance premiums, or having their homes labelled as hazards by a council overstepping its authority. It's your home's value that will plummet when they label it a hazard. It may even become uninsurable. And there has already been suggestions by the council that they buy them now relocating residents who have lived on the coast without hassle for generations. So please share this video widely and join local groups to fight this authoritarian nonsense. I've been Andy Oakley. Thank you. Well, that was also informative, I thought. Very good. Uh, Andy makes a good point as well, and uh, do some research as well. Don't just listen to one narrative, because at the end of the day, that's what science is all about. Except, unfortunately, it seems these days, one side of science gets overlooked or suppressed. Um, CO2 levels, uh, it's an interesting topic in itself. And, uh, you know, there are some within certain governmental organisations that believe cows put more CO2 into the atmosphere than a vehicle. Well, I, I set a challenge that I would like the uh, official to go into a garage with a car. I'll go into a garage with a cow <laughs> and we'll have a discussion in the morning as to who's correct. Um, now, I'd just like to introduce our next guest speaker. Uh, he's a very informative chap, and you will enjoy this. Sean Rush is a Wellington-based barrister. He holds a Master's in Climate Change Science and Policy, 
and a master's in law and petroleum law and policy. Sean was an expert reviewer for the IPCC's sixth assessment report, the physical sciences, and appeared as an expert witness for Coastal Ratepayers Group in our Kapiti Coast District Council Coastal Planning Hearing. From 2019 to 2022, he was also Wellington City Councillor. Please give a warm welcome to Mr Sean Rush. Hey, just uh, conscious that you guys have been sitting very uh, politely. Do you want to have a couple of minutes just to have a bit of a stretch, a bit of a chin wag? And, uh, and I also, uh, you know, um, genuinely admire you've, you've sat through quite a bit of complicated science there. So, uh, well done. How am I going to... How am I Unless you want to turn round, unless you just want to turn round and press the button. Well, how else do I tell you? Uh, just around. <laughs> Give it a go. Right, I've got I've got eleven slides, and just just while you're sitting back down and settling, I'll just say a few words about Andy's talk. Um, as part of my, my climate studies, um, the scientist that uh, was mentioned earlier, John Christie, um, in the University of Alberta in Huntsville, uh, he's indeed highly decorated, um, but doesn't quite go with the flow, if you like, but he's very much about the observations, and the observations steer him. And in, in fact, actually, um, when it was pointed out that actually your satellite uh, has got some problems, he actually fixed it, and to his credit, as the mainstream scientists agreed and acknowledged, uh, they said, you've got to appreciate the integrity of these guys. So uh, I actually, um, you know, the great thing about climate science actually is that all the uh, published papers that you can get when you're at university um, have who wrote them, and they've got email addresses. So I emailed John Christie, and I'm thinking, you know, John, we were talking about your satellite the other day. My, my lecturer claimed it was just a weather satellite. Hey, what, what do you know? I wake up in the morning and he's emailed back. Oh, good to hear from you, Sean. I hope the studies are going well. Um, yeah, you can tell, uh, well, I can tell you the lecturer's name. You can tell, yeah, it was a weather satellite, but it actually, initially when it was put up there, but we actually made, managed to modify it, and now it also does climate. Which is, you know, okay, that's a fair explanation, but uh, my lecturer was deliberately downplaying the impact that this guy's science could possibly have on his class. And, uh, you know, and that was just uh, one set of exchanges that I've had with John uh, over a number of years, including some of the, the measurements that you just saw. So um, I like the guy. He, he's open. He's transparent. He answers questions. Some of the other scientists that I've actually reached out to with some awkward questions who, you know, work for some of the, the, the big climate mainstream groups um, don't, don't reply at all. Um, and actually, uh, and that's been quite disappointing. Uh, other experiences I've had with some of the local climate scientists, um, and I'll, not not all of them for sure, but uh, are very quick to uh, you know play the man, not the ball, um, in order to steer me away from from actually looking more closely at, at science that might not quite fit with with a narrative. So uh, anyway, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, something a bit more local, which is about um, the, the sea level rise and, and how the um, you know, how the Capital Council have got to where they are today. Um, I could speak a lot more on, on broader things, but yeah, I mean, I, I did my masters in climate change in 2019. At the end of that year, uh, I, I stood for the city council and, and was elected. Uh, as a consequence, I got very engaged in all things climate around Wellington, in particular Wellington, which extends up to the Kapiti Coast, the Greater Wellington region, and, and my hometown Napier as well, I should say. Um, and, and I suppose, um, and you know, it gave me a great opportunity because I had access to, to NIWA studies that, that don't normally sort of proliferate in the uh, public sort of discourse. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that I did know already was that actually land subsides. Um, and so, um, can we go to the next slide? So I'm going to have to signal for the next slide. So. 
So, so when I, uh, 1st of May 2022, it was a Sunday evening, and, and out came this narrative about this incredible new study, um, and, and this was the headline, Sinking Cities, and, and that's where we got this thing, Petoni's going to be underwater in 10 or 20 years, same with the South Coast, which were, you know, my, my constituents actually, South Coast residents. The thing was, that it just really struck me as being very odd because it was so inconsistent with what I already knew about what was happening with sea level rise and what they call vertical land movement, which is the land moving up and down. And, and so it really bothered me. And one of my former roles, I was the asset manager of the Maui pipeline, which is the big pipeline that goes from Taranaki up to, to Huntley. And one of the big problems we have is land movement. And so we, uh, you know, this is all backed up by Shell, Todd and, and OMV, so major organisations, massive piece of infrastructure. Uh, we spent a lot of money on making sure we got those measurements right. So I had a, um, I wouldn't say an expertise in that area, but I knew people who did. And so when the study came out, I reached out to them and said, look, this sounds really odd to me because I know that the Wellington Tide Gauge shows that actually um, uh, sea level fell after the Kaikoura earthquake and actually it's, it's been trending about the same as it has been for a long time. And um, the thing was that they, this, this, the study was promoted by a, a group called the Sea Rise Project. But, uh, two, two guys at um, Victoria University who I, who I knew through my studies. Um, and then a, a, a broader range of um, uh, folks from, from GNS. Um, and each of them had different roles and different responsibilities and wrote different papers, some of which were consistent with the sort of narrative and, and others that weren't actually. But the fundamental basis was that the, the, the new thing they'd done is to take satellite data um, at two kilometre spacings around the coast and um, over a seven or eight year period. And uh, it was done through what they call an interseismic period. So GNS did this across the whole of New Zealand. And um, the thing about an interseismic period is that that's the bit where New Zealand sinks. <laughs> Because it's the, it's the seismic activity that actually where it lifts. And over the very long term, New Zealand's been coming out of the water for, for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, from Kapiti Coast has got, you know, over the 6,000 years has accreted out closer to Australia. Miramar went to come up to, to um, two metres. Um, so, yeah, and certainly Hawke's Bay, where I grew up, Taranel, um, you go up to the, the local um, lookout at... Um, um, it's called um, Sugarloaf, <laughs> Sugarloaf, and you can see fossilised shellfish beds right in the highest part of, of the area. So, you know, this idea that, that on the long term we're sinking, you know, it's not. The Zealandia is coming out of the water, which is great news. Uh, short term, though, for sure, you can get these short periods where you're settling down, particularly after a, like a 1931 earthquake. You know, all that land came up where the airport is. It's subsiding now, but it's not subsiding rapidly. Um, and it actually, what, what, what I have learnt now is actually there's actually these small, minor, tiny earthquakes that go for a year or two, which actually slowly lift things up. And we're seeing that in Kapiti, um, a whole centimetre first half of last year. Um, so anyway, get back to the slide. Um, so you, you, you had the, this announcement um, so, I, I very quickly, one of my colleagues who's a senior geologist uh, reached out to GNS and said, can you send us the study? And it came back saying, um, one of the project leads came back and said, uh, well, it's still in draft. So, you know, a little bit about the scientific method, right? So, first of all, it's unusual for scientists to be on TV and doing a road show around media and councils explaining their new WhatsApp gimmick, whatever it might be, the usual thing is they write it all up, publish it in a journal, go to a geophysical conference or, or what have you, and, and explain it to everybody, get cross-examined by everyone in the peer review process, and then you go along to the Ministry of Environment and say, look, everyone's said this is great, now use it for policy. 
This didn't happen on this occasion. Uh, a week long of, of meetings, starting with, uh, with James Shaw, uh, the very unparliamentary uh, language he talked about, um, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, the head of the Climate Change Commission, all on TV, a, a local guy who I know on the South Coast, Eugene Doyle. Um, and they're really, so, so in an odd way, they're doing this really backwards. And what concerned me was some of the language being used, which all led to both of these scientists concluding by, it could be as little as 10 years, we're going to need to get our managed retreat strategy organised. Well, where did that language come from? So anyway, um, can we go to the next slide? So we did this round, and, and as I say, I mean, you've, you've got the... Meanwhile, 10 kilometres away at Queen's Wharf, you've got that. That is the actual tide gauge data. You can see the peak right at the end. That's the Kaikoura earthquake. And then it drops. And at the time that came out, the uh, sea level at Queen's Wharf was about where it was at some peaks in the 1950s. Not really that concerning. So can we go to the next one? What else happened that week? Well, the Ministry for the Environment launched their Managed Retreat Program. <laughs> now, I went uh, after the Ministry of Environment, and I said, well, have you guys been sort of like talking with this group? Turned out that they'd done a comms plan months earlier, a 33-page comms plan, that determined that even if their study hadn't been published, they'll go ahead anyway. And sure enough, in their Managed Retreat consultation documents, they referenced this unpublished uh, study that had yet to be even submitted to peer review. Now, th just want to be very clear, look, this is real novel stuff, it's really exciting stuff, but, you know, you never take a very short-term data set that you know is probably a bit biased and then extrapolate it out for 50 to 100 years of planning and then join it up with what I'll show you to be quite extreme estimates of sea level and go, look, it's twice as bad as we thought, Petoni's going to be inundated in 10, 20 years. I mean, what are businesses in Petoni thinking about this? Then you've got the Insurance Council. They were, they were making that call a few um, months ago as well. And I touched base with the president of the Insurance Council, Tim Graft, and I said to Tim, who I know from my city council days, I said, Tim, do you realise that this is not going to happen, that the study has not passed peer review, and actually, um, you know, it's very dangerous of you to have your members thinking this way. And Tim came back, and he's done this before, and said, well, actually, sea level rise is entirely predictable. It's not something you can ensure, so it's not an issue for us. And yet, you'd think by what we're hearing from insurance companies, it's a big issue for them. And yet, I'm being told by the president of the council it's not. Anyway, so, um, no, go back, please. Yeah, so, so there's the Ministry of Environment. They tweeted on the Sea Rise Twitter feed um, that the new data shows the sea level is rising twice as fast as previously. Um, this information is timely as we launched the Climate Change Draft Adaptation Plan last week. James Shaw's um, centrepiece piece of legislation he wanted out and done before the end of the term. Um, so, and just to have a look, so that's the online tool you can see there. This is the, the left panel. So you can see each one of those dots represents a location where the satellite has made a measurement, um, which they have then averaged, and then they, they've logged that onto a, an online tool where you can go online and go, well, and you can go to Otaki Beach, where, where my uh, batch is, um, and you can see what, they, what their predictions are about both the vertical land movement, which is all subsidence, all subsidence, because that's what their short-term data set said, and their, their long-term predictions about sea level rise um, going out, I think, to 2150, and they helpfully put it in 10-year um, milestones. And they, that data set starts at 2005, and uh, as we'll see shortly, we can see how that data set has performed against the actual observations. Can you try the next one? So yeah, I mean, none of this made sense to me because like, a lot, like we've seen a lot before, my place is the X on the Marine Parade on the beach there, right? So that's the probably the closest property, maybe, maybe the surf club's a bit closer. Closest property, my neighbour 
and his his dad actually bought that block where that that row of four um, houses are, and uh, and put him relocated their property in the late 50s, I think it was. And he tells me that you know you could actually the front lawn was where the the beach was. So that accretion is going. Uh, it's not made up. It's real and. Um, you know, we're, we're planning on putting a, an, <laughs> we actually need to put another story on because we can't see the bloody beach because the damn sand dunes are so high. <laughs> and actually I was at my neighbour's place who says we do have a second floor and we're on the balcony and I realised, you realise Tim, I can't actually see the beach from your place anymore because the dunes have gone up a foot in the, in the five or six years since we've been neighbours. <laughs> Um, so anyway, and, and, and that's the um, survey we had done. I don't know if there's any surveyors here who might be able to help me with the next bit, but um, surveyors uh, will, will link back, and they've done this since the 50s. The, the, the tide get, there's um, a number of tide gauges that are set up around New Zealand. For the one that matters for, for us here in Kapiti is the one in Queen's Wharf uh, in Wellington that, that I showed you before. And... Um, and by a series of datum points all around the country, uh, surveyors are able to come in with those theodolites they use and figure out where the sea level is according to this property. So there it is, the nail's right at the bottom, and sea level is six metres below it. So, and they're telling me that, uh, you know, I should have a, I've got a problem that's coming. The beach is getting further away, the house is six metres above sea level, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I'm hardly even on the coast. <laughs> so, but that's the way it's done. So, can we go to the next slide, please? I love that. So, what's the problem here? So, I've tipped you off a couple of times, but the sea level is just not rising as fast as the model, right? So, here's, here's their model, which you can find on their website. And that location is like the top left hand side of the graph, 2502. That is the location where the Wellington Harbour tide gauge is located as well. So you can see what their model says, and I'm using the, um, the more generous, um, less scary scenario of 2 to hyphen 4.5. That's the middle of the road I think that Tanya mentioned earlier. We wouldn't be here uh, if, if that was the, the, the scenario that, uh, that we were using. But even using that one, it tells us that, and I've circled it, that... 0.11 metres of sea level rise by 2020. That's the first milestone. So the, the models run from 2015 to 2020. It's telling us that we should get 11 centimetres of sea level rise, and you can infer from that actually um, uh, five centimetres of that would be from the land movement. Can we go to the next slide? Here's the sea level um, measurements from the... Wellington Harbour tide gauge going back to about 1944. It's a bit messy, I know, and it's a bit different. But what you can see is there's a fairly gradual rise of about two millimetres a year. It's hard to tell because it's the the, um, the graphs a bit spiky, but it's it's fairly gradual, and and you can see that peak in Kaikoura in 2016, and it's dropped uh, considerably after that, and that's because the land's come up. And we know that you can go down, you know, being along the Kaikoura coast can see how much land came up, two metres along that place. But what you can see from these numbers, they're all on um, NIWA's, well, they're accessible through a, uh, an open access um, robust data set that NIWA rely on, is that actually there was only two centimetres of sea level rise, relative sea level rise, that is. So you've got a model telling us it's 11, and over a 15-year period, it gets it so wrong because it's actually two, so it's 550% wrong. And this is the model that these guys are using to tell us that we need to get away from the, 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 the sea because it's all coming to get us. Can we go to the next slide? The, the other point is, is the vertical land movement component. Now, as I say, they, they did the satellite measurements during what they call an interseismic period. And that was because the guys that actually did the satellite measurements, they weren't interested in this coastal stuff. They are interested in a, a nationwide analysis of, of how New Zealand moves horizontally. And, uh, and the vertical component was actually just a, a bit on the, you know, in a side matter for them. And what they wanted to do was to make sure that they didn't, they minimised the period to minimise the number of earthquakes that would have that shaking feeling um, movement, 
which would sort of like make the data set hard to read and hard to interpret it. They wanted a nice long period where it was relatively stable. But the problem is, of course, those interseismic stable periods are the periods where you get the subsiding trend. And this is from uh, GNS, uh, a leading um, uh, study. Uh, the, the graph there highlights how, how it all works. You have these slow slip of events, SSEs they call them. And what we've got, so here in New Zealand we've got uh, the uh, Pacific plate going underneath the Australian plate. New Zealand's on the Australian plate, off the coast of the Wairapa. It's been dragged down. And every now and again, it pops back up, and that's 1931 and 1855 and Kaikoura. It all pops back up. But there's also these slower little ratcheting effects that have been well documented by NIWA for the Greater Wellington Regional Council, known as slow slip events. And NIWA said in 2019 in their study, it's pretty much cancelled out the subsiding trend, right? So none of that's featuring in the, the study that we're talking about um, that hasn't made it through publication. So you can see how if you actually only take that very sharp red uh, vertical interseismic rate, take the average over a much longer period, then the subsiding trend is, is ameliorated, I suppose, to being something a lot less. And then when you add it to a Kaikoura uplift, then it actually wipes out the whole lot. So, you know, we, we've got this vertical land movement trend, which has been done during this interseismic period, now being extrapolated forward, and no wonder Petoni's, you know, underwater, but it's simply not going to happen. So, um, more recently, uh, in terms of carpeting, so I hear in a video I saw today from KCDC, uh, the, the Jacob scientist talking about uh, carpet had been subject to subsidence. Well, it was, for sure. And it happens up and down and so on. But, you know, at the moment, it's on a glorious um, run of, of uplift. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's uh, from Dr. Dolores Wallace from GNS. She's the expert on these slow slip events. And she posted on the GNS website that you've got this horizontal movement, but also a centimetre of upward displacement. Well, when you're talking about you know, a couple of millimetres um, over a, a year or two or four, four years or something like that, and you get a centimetre in six months, you might start thinking maybe it's not such a big issue. So, um, so there's a couple of things, and there are, there's a number of uh, peer-reviewed papers that uh, cover all this, uh, which in my view, well, well they have been ignored um, by, uh, by the, this group and also by the Ministry for Environment who have fast-tracked their study into policy and now coastal councils around the nation are following it because they have to. Can we go to the next slide? But, you know, we've, we've got um, contrary positions from, um, from academics. So these guys at Vic University in Otago who are leading chaps in the field of uh, geosciences. They presented at last year's Geoscience of New Zealand's conference and, you know, basically went through the tide gauges and said, actually, the tide gauges still provide a really good measure of whether this model is working because um, they've got concerns about the, the model working. We'll go to the next slide. And if, and if you really want to look at the best available science, well, you could actually do something a little bit old-fashioned, which is take the average of the, uh, the Wellington tide gauge. You can see that that's that dotted red line that starts at the beginning. And you go through to 2004, where the model starts, and simply take the average from there through to 2030, you actually get a really good fit. It's actually near spot on, actually. I mean, if you take the Kaikoura spike out, it's near spot on. And I, I bet you by 2030, this model will be far more accurate than the model that is being used by the Ministry of the Environment that was generated by the Sea Rise team. And I would, you know, if they're right and my batch is worthless, then I'll <laughs> put it on the line. I did not do that. My wife might be a bit upset. So, and, and, and actually, that is actually consistent 
with um, what, what I, I note there is a, uh, a paper called Denise and All 2020. So Paul Denise is an Otago University professor and he specialises in sea level. His, that paper that he refers to actually had the, the Grand Fromage of the New Zealand sea level um, um, expertise. And they did this study and they came out with a view that actually Wellington and Wellington area um, is sea levels going up on average around about 2.1 millimetres a year. And that's pretty consistent um, when you take in the, the vertical land movement, which um, you know, is consistent with uh, global sort of sea level trends. I mean, what they're asking us to, to now believe is that the, the trend that happened over the 20th century, which was about 20 centimetres, over the whole 20th century, which had a lot of global warming. Yeah, let's, let's, let's be recognised that, that there was a lot of global warming over the 20th century, only 20 centimetres. Now they're telling us that it's going to go up to you know, 80 a metre or 1.2. But at the moment, every year, every year that it's still actually just pedestrian, you know, in a pedestrian manner, goes up by the same amount as it did the year before, or when my dad was at St Pat's Town back in the 50s, um, it starts looking more and more like a, you know, like a failed model. What do you know? A failed model. We, ch we checked it against the uh, observations and it failed. Should go back to the drawing board. We go to the next, should be. Okay, this is really busy and I'm not going to talk too much to it, but I this afternoon, I see KCDC released a video uh, of uh, the Jacobs chief scientist, um, who, who, like me, he's got a master's, actually. I don't think he's got a PhD, but he has been doing coastal planning for decades, so I'll give him that, to be fair. But, you know, these, these consultants are... Um, they don't do their own science. They don't take an independent view and go, well, actually what these guys have done is not accurate. We think actually we should be doing what Sean says, who, who I should say is backed up by a number of, of other credible scientists. They simply say, well, the Ministry for Environment have said, here's the guidelines, it's based on the IPCC this, it's based on the sea rise that, it's based on the vertical land, blah, 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 blah. run it through them, and, and that's where we get to. And then they add in some of the more nuances around coastal planning, um, the sediment flow, those sorts of things. But they don't actually challenge uh, or challenge themselves to look at what's actually going on and how the underlying um, theory has been created. And it's a shame because, uh, you know, I think they're all, you know, very credible people. I mean, one chap from Tonkin Taylor, who's just done a similar study for Hawke's Bay, Within three days, he posted on the Tonkin Taylor website that there's something not right here because the measurements they're getting is totally at odds with what I know of a place I've been working at. Didn't stop him writing up the report uh, how the Ministry for Environment wanted it. I mean, I've challenged him. I said, well, you know, why, how have you justified that considering what you've said? And I'm waiting for him to get back to me. But... Well, I've had to go to the, uh, you know, so fortunately, or unfortunately, but I, I worked very closely with the Mayor of Napier being a Napier boy um, on the Three Waters reform, so um, she's making sure that this chap's going to get back to me, plus the official information. Act. So, um, and I was going to say, so, you know, w what strikes me here, folks, is that the, if you remember the, um, the, the leaky building fiasco, where, where all the councils took advice from government and then that advice was proliferated out, and yet the government advice was wrong, and a lot of people got hurt. You know, people aren't going to be hurt like, like this, although, if, you know, if we get to a point where, uh, you know, our, our politicians create law that say that when the model tells us that you're going to get wet and you can't live in your property, we're going to pull you out. Now, that's, that's a doomsday scenario. Surely, surely that can't happen. But the, uh, the guys that have done the draft of the, the working paper for managed retreat, well, they've got some really extreme ideas. They, they, they actually was, it was drafted by the Environmental Defence Society, right, which is a, an environmental activist group. Nothing wrong with that, I should add. But who was it funded by? AIG? Wellington City Council? Becker? My goodness, these are ASB as well. And I'm sort of going, well, first of all, why is the Ministry of Environment paying for this? Secondly, you know, when I saw AIG, I just went, oh my God, you know, these guys are funding, 
sort of promotional literature which will have a, a benefit for them to be able to justify putting up insurance rates. They don't want to take it away. They're just going to say, well, you know, it's got climate change now. And just to emphasise also one of the slides that I saw earlier, believe it or not, the, the, the changes we're seeing in climate here in New Zealand are not significant over the longer term. And actually, when you, you look underneath and behind the headlines, you actually find some quite reassuring, sure, there's some changes, no question about it, but things like Tropical Cyclone Gabrielle, you know, NEWA predicted, NEWA and the Met Office every year put out in October their annual projections for what's going to happen for the tropical cyclone season. And every year, a near normal year would be six to ten of these things forming, and one or two will come close to the coast of New Zealand. And that's what they said, and that's what happened. You know, it's as simple as that. And, um, but, you know, we, we should be vigilant. And uh, we, we, what I'm seeing, though, is the, the thermal response. So that's the, we know that adding greenhouse gases will cause a warming atmosphere, and we're seeing that. And so the models actually do, when they say the models have done quite well, well, they did predict that. Yeah, sure, greenhouse gases. But when it comes to extreme weather events and, and so forth, the models are not doing very well at all. And actually what we're hearing is more, more the narrative than actually the science. And the science in the report that I was an expert reviewer for had this nice table um, which showed that actually the, the, the sort of um, what they call the dynamic response, which is kind of things like, you know, um, um, changes in weather patterns are not really, we're not really seeing them. But those changes that come through the, what they call the thermal response, which is a bit warmer. So less frost days, yep, got that. Um, you know, and uh, you know, more heat waves, yep, got that. So those sorts of things, okay, they are happening. They're not happening all over. Anyway, I don't want to get into climate change too much. But <laughs> anyway, so I, I've just been through, I've, I've dealt with a few things already, but um, you know, I, I felt that, uh, the, the, you know, I've mentioned that the charts that uh, talk about the scenarios that Jacobs are using uh, uh, fail the observation test, 550% out. They're never, ever going to be accurate if after 15 years they're already that far out. Uh, the manuscript remains unpublished. Uh, they submitted it in July last year. Uh, it got rejected. It was resubmitted in October last year. It still hasn't been published. So there, there are real question marks. And how on earth the Ministry of Environment decided to jump all in on this study? Well, the fact is that the government has invested $20 million in it, right? So they got $7 million to do the, the initial study with the online tool and so forth, which is an interesting thing in itself. But, you know, it's totally irrelevant for policy making. And then they've been given another $13 million, which I think is actually, they're going to try and figure out how they actually make it reflect what we're seeing, you know, in the, in the, in the tide gauges. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting piece of work, but um, I, I do tend to think that perhaps somewhere someone's gone, we need to carry on with this because otherwise someone, someone somewhere is going to look bad. Um, so I'll be taking it up with the new Ministry for, Minister for Environment. I'm about to release a uh, sequel. So I was going to say that why was it called Wellington Sinking? Um, a leading geoscientist, the leading geoscientist, I'd say, in New Zealand, a guy called um, Bruce Hayward, uh, who I've never met, frankly, but um, he published in the Geoscience New Zealand newsletter in November a, a piece called Is Auckland Sinking? And what do you know, Bruce has identified the same issues that I've been talking about right now, but Bruce is a real heavyweight. Bruce is the heavyweight. So I reached out to him, I said, you know, Bruce, I've been looking at this, and from Wellington's perspective, similar sort of things, but... And he was very complimentary and encouraging, so I've been thrilled that um, he said, if, if they won't publish it, Sean, tell them to get in touch with me. So I'm thrilled to say that it will be published, so I can't share it with you now. But it shows, highlights some of the issues, but also references some of the scientific studies that back up what I'm saying. Um, RCP 8.5 is, is uh, I hear from the video this afternoon, the, the plus version is not going to be used, which is great. They're still wedded to the RCP 8.51, one, 
which uh, climate scientists in the last report, the one that I was an expert reviewer for, actually lobbied to say it's implausible. They, in the end, the language they settled on was it's very unlikely. Well, what on earth are we doing using it for coastal planning here in New Zealand? Um, and this is a worldwide thing. It's got a lot of scientists around the world all going the same. The next uh, IPCC report will probably not have that scenario there. They want, they want to actually come up with scenarios that are realistic. So, um, so I'm just going to finish it up there. Um, yeah, the Ministry of Environment's guidance uh, is wholly based on the sea rise study, and uh, which remains unpublished. I mean, how can it possibly be reflecting the latest and best science when the scientific community has kicked it out once and uh, may still kick it out again? Anyway. Thank you, Sean. That's awesome. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a Q&A, but um, another little fun fact, um, when it comes to consultancy firms, and uh, Sean mentioned, uh, well, the Jacobs has been mentioned quite extensively this evening, they lobby to councils quite extensively, and your ratepayers' money is paying for this. Uh, there's a number of uh, big consultancy firms that work in New Zealand, and I'll just go through a, a couple of them now. WSP, they've got an office down in the Petone foreshore. This US company with 60,000 staff tied up with Helen Clark Foundation and took over Opus. You've got the Jacobs, which is a US company again with 60,000 staff, and so far they've extracted $25 billion in revenue out of New Zealand. 25 billion of your ratepayers' money that the councils use for consultancy work and government. Is that with a B? Yep. Um, ACOM, another US company with 51,000 staff. They've extracted out of New Zealand and New Zealand revenue 20 billion. You've got Becca, the Southeast Asian based company in 70 nations. And Uricon, which is an Aussie based Southeast Asian. Uh, New Zealand company. So, you know, rate rises coming up, everybody, who's happy? Not me. It's quite ironic that we pay the council to make laws against us, but anyway, I digress. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A now. If anyone's got any questions that you would like to ask any of our presenters, I'm going to now uh, work off my dinner by running around with this microphone. So put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Hello, folks. Now's a good time. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's always the way that the first hello works. And yeah. yeah. Uh, we want the video to hear you, though. Ah, uh, is that better? Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, look, hey, thank you for such an informative evening. That's been really interesting. I'd, um, I'd like to just clarify a couple of things, particularly from the uh, lady who did the first presentation. Uh, thank you. No. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'd like to ask uh, a couple of clarifying questions from the lady who did the first presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, when I found out about this meeting, I downloaded the Northern Area Adaptation Plan from the website. Uh, and it talks about two things that I'm not quite sure about relative to your presentation. Um, the first is that it talks about um, that they, uh, the panel is using two sea level rise projections. Uh, one is the SSP 2 to 4.5, and the second is the higher SSP 5 to 8.5 scenario. And what they're doing is they're using it to compare a range of uh, the number of affected properties. So two sea, level, two sea level rise scenarios are being used, not the one you mentioned. Uh, the second is that it talks about a range of... Um, steps that can be taken to mitigate the effect of the projected sea level rise. Uh, managed retreat is always the last option con considered in the panel's program of actions. Uh, it's always put as, as a long-term option of managed retreat. 
uh, the paper's not very clear about what, the, what it means by long term, but I assume that's somewhere between 70 and 100 years away. Yeah, so look, can I, that's why I want to get clarified, because it doesn't talk about what is long term um, in its presentations, but I don't think it's in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So can you clarify those two things, please? I, I will to the best of my ability. Um, so I'm not a scientist either. I've only been on board with this since the end of July and it is a lot to take on. As far as I know, um, CAP had in the beginning, they had time scenarios. So they had about 30 years, um, 50 years, and then 100 years as a scenario. Um, they've since changed that and now they're looking at trigger points. Um, and so we're worried are they trigger points that the community gets to um, decide on as well? Or is it just um, what CAP decides is, is a trigger point? Um, as far as the SSP, um, I'm pretty sure that's just a, the new name for RCP. Um, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I just want to say, though, that, that I don't know, is any real estate agents in the, in the room? Yeah, have you had any people make inquiries about beachfront properties and concern about sea level rise? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, a friend of mine, she moved, is moving from Hawke's Bay down to here and, um, and s decided not to go to a particular open home because she'd been on the Sea Rise online tool which told her that it would be a very dangerous place to be in 10, 15 years' time. So. You know, that's, that's a very small and one-off maybe, but, you know, we're hearing actually real estate agents. Uh, and that's going to have an effect on house values. People hear me? <laughs> yes, can if you keep it up there. Okay. Um, yeah, so this property went on the market and um, I spoke to a prospective buyer and she said to me, oh, what's the story about there's a slither of the, your property um, that's... As it were, and, the, and she found this out on the limb. Yeah. Okay, so um, you know, and that was put there, as everyone else knows, you know, without consultation on the property owners or anyone else. Yeah. So yeah. So so my property, I'm going to guess the same. I'm, I've seen the language that's been used. So at the moment, I believe the language is something like um, this property has been identified as potentially having. Uh, being part of a hazard zone and is subject to final review by CAP or some, something like that. But it's there. It's there right there and, uh, you know, that's going to affect um, your ability to, to sell the property. I'd just like to say that I, I know of a person I spoke to last year on in the building industry and went to uh, do some maintenance work on a house for someone. It's uh, someone we know. They are in a property that he inherited from his father. Uh, it has a retaining wall in front of the property. He's not allowed to do any work on that property. Council, he wanted to demolish it and rebuild. Council told him that he can't do anything on that property and effectively has made his property worthless. That's uh, his words. Good, good evening. Another great evening and a lot more information and this is the third meeting that I've been to of such high caliber and good speakers and all the rest of it. However, I'm realistic enough to know that these things all cost money and at the last meeting the CAP suggested that all people that are affected, and most of us in the room here, should chip in with a thousand dollars. Now, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether or not you uh, um, sent that out in writing it was just just from the from here so uh, I'll take it now <laughs> well, well it came from a clue yeah. but this is all part of the same issue so how did we go uh, that's a matter of, it was the coastal rate pays United AGM when uh, when that was discussed and I, I think we I don't want to put anyone here on the spot uh, we got enough funds to put together um, uh, what we're th saying is, well, I don't want to say publicly, we got enough, mo enough money to put together uh, a, a, a counter report by uh, a professional which we will be distributing and using 
uh, in discussions with council. So, um, but there will be a phase two, which could involve, you know, unfortunately, um, this is heading towards courts. Um, the, and this study has been in front of the courts already and has been uh, challenged, and, and that challenge was unanswered. So anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get MFB to see sense and maybe through the new politics we can we can avoid all that and get it written up properly, but um, there, there might be a new call for money. So yes, don't let that scare you all off. We will, um, but um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there will be probably litigation that uh, we might need to take. This, um, the gentleman was alluding to the AGM meeting for crew, and uh, at that time, there was a, a, a report that could be commissioned there was a required funds and there was a uh, call put out for anyone who would like to help to uh, fund uh, the commissioning of this report. The report is very imminent. It's not too far away, but um, that crew has taken care of that. And uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about what's coming out, so stay tuned. Any other questions? Oh, okay, thank you. Now, my name is Dana Lee. I have owned, my family owned property on the beachfront in, in, in Manly Street for over, just under 100 years in the family. Now, I've seen in the past, looking at where I've been living, that it's an increase, not decreasing, the land out in front is just getting bigger and bigger. Now, I spoke to Jim Bollinger and he's having a cup of coffee at Coastal. And I said, are you going to make a dispensation for all those properties that are increasing in the land in front of your place? Now, why should I be... The rates keep on going up. I think you've got people in the wrong positions in council and government that are making indecisive decisions which should be really looked at. It all affects us. If your rates keep on going up, it's going to push people out of the area into lower line, into areas which are basically non, you know, anyway, that's it. So, you know, really, we're all losing. So I would like to know what your views are on this, please. What was the final question? What's your views? Yeah. Did you say what, what, what our views are? You know, you know, it's an interesting point you make about the accretion because, you know, I, I would like to actually like, you know, put another floor underneath with a garage, but actually I'd like to go further towards the beach, but it's it's all road reserve and I dare not put my head above the parapet. But I mean, that land is actually, you know, I, I could actually happily use that. So, I mean, um, you know, what what we're planning on doing is exactly what we're doing tonight, which is trying to raise awareness. Um, you know, what I'd really like to do is actually sit down with some of the scientists involved and say, look, can you please help me understand? Because I've been trying to bloody do it for two and a half years and they keep fobbing me off and they won't talk to me. Some of them ignore me. And, uh, you know, at one point in time, I was actually a city councillor and they did the same thing, not to mention the fact that I'm part of their own uh, School of Earth Science and Geography. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to get a scientist in the room with me and we can have a discussion about it, I'd love to because um, I just don't, you know, and, and that's my first uh, red flag is that, oh, they don't want to speak with me. So when I, this first thing came out, I contacted, as I mentioned earlier, some folks that I knew. I, I, I contacted the, the, uh, the scientists that actually supported crew back in 2013, along with a, a coastal uh, planner from Christchurch City Council who also had concerns. I set up a meeting that they said that they would happily attend, but when they found out that I was bringing some expertise that would challenge them, they told me, uh, um, they told me no, and one of them started questioning my motives and uh, was actually quite rude about it. And, and ever since then, I've had to use the Official Information Act just to get some sense out of these taxpayer-funded scientists. You say it's still, it's still developing on the front beachfront. Anyway. Okay, we have another question here. Good evening. My name is Glenn. Um, I would just like to ask the three councillors that are here this evening, 
that we have elected. If they could speak to the room about what they've learnt this evening and how they're going to take what they've learnt this evening back to council. Because it's all very well to come along to a meeting and sit there as part of the whole consultation process, but I would like to see exactly what they're going to do with this new learnt information that they've received tonight. So, a good question. Would you like to answer? There's only, only one councillor, one councillor left. Uh, yes, I'm Glenn Cooper, I'm your um, Tarifala Urban Board councillor. Oh, no, Nigel's here. Not going to go first, he's a better speaker than me. Uh, so, look, I've been really supportive of, uh, of CALM and uh, of CREW for uh, the past three or four years. In fact, I was a member of CREW. Uh, resigned when I stood for council. Um, as that would be a conflict of interest in any future decision making. So well, I'm, I'm open, I'm open minded. We had Jacobs um, come and present to us um, at a meeting, a closed meeting. I sought some questions from Sean and from other um, learned people uh, to, to question Jacobs on and, and hold them to account as, as best I could without being a scientist. And, uh, I'll continue to do that. I'll continue to be challenging uh, to uh, the council and the process uh, with an open mind because um, I'd hate to be predetermined on anything. Can't be predetermined. predetermined. Uh, as many of you know, I fought the council against the Cubby Gateway. Uh, I put a peg in the ground on something I thought was inherently wrong and, um, and not right. And I'll do the same on this piece of work as well. So you can be assured that uh, I'll, I'll fight for the people who put me into uh, the council, which is the, the community, and I'll do everything in my power uh, as a trustee of your vote and uh, of the community to make sure that, that good, you, uh, good decisions are made. shut the uh, consultation down then? Well, I, I'm not... I'm not allowing anything. I'm challenging the questions at the appropriate time uh, on one voice, as, as we all are. And, um, you know, it, it, unfortunately, the CAPS process was signed off before um, the current lot were elected. And to a big degree, we're stuck with that process. Um, whether we uh, end up using the CAP Takatai um, outcomes is something to be discussed in council. So, yeah, but I'll hand over to I've spoken enough. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Glenn Cooper. Uh, here's Nigel. Uh, hi, Nigel Wilson. Uh, like Glenn, I uh, can't express a personal view. Um, predetermination is a, is a weapon that gets used. Um, so, I'm not predetermined. Well, the reason I'm here is because. Um, a lot of the people involved here have been demonised. Um, everybody needs a fair hearing. There's a whole lot of stuff at stake here. I mean, um, people's houses are at stake, their, their livelihoods at stake. There's a whole bunch of things, right? So it's really important that you listen to, um, that all of the science is, is thought about um, and is examined. I'm not a climate scientist. Sean, you've got the... You've got the legs on me on that one. Um, and there will be a whole variety of opinions that are expressed, and our job is to, is to filter our way through that. What, the one thing I can say, because this, isn't, <coughs> this doesn't uh, directly affect what's happening now, but the first time round, when council drew a line on a map, basically, it was an arbitrary line, but a lot of people here will remember that, it was a red line, and if you're on this side of the red line, you were all going to die. <coughs> and if you're on the other side of the line, you're going to be okay. And it, was, and it was nonsense, and it was challenged, and uh, the challenge was successful in court, and so we're back into this, this process. So all I can tell you is that I will be looking at all of this with an open mind. Uh, good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, look, I, I can't really add too much more than that uh, myself. Um, I've got a second term councillor. I've sat down with Prue Quinton, you'd know that, uh, and, and done what I can to get a good understanding of things. And I must admit, in the last triennium, there was a lot of 
uh, barriers put in our way with regards to uh, sitting down with crew uh, to get that information. Why do I do that and why am I here tonight, just like the other two councillors with me here, uh, to have an open, we have an open mind but we don't have an empty mind. Um, we want to be informed. Um, Sean, the report that you've got coming out, very, very interested to um, read that when it comes out. Um, it's all information that we take on board. I would remind everybody that um, the key word for me tonight that Tanya mentioned was triggers with regards to, that's a significant part of this report. Um, but this is part of a process and uh, this is heading towards a coastal plan change, maybe in two or three years time. And this is only the first step in that process, uh, which is information gathering. Um, so no decisions are being made by CAP. The information that comes back in May, just to make it clear, no decisions will be getting made at that point either. It will be an accepting of the information as part of that coastal plan change process. There will be a consultation process, more than likely numerous ones, through that process where you will all get the opportunity to submit your views. And we will more than likely read every single one of them. Will it be peer reviewed? Will what be peer reviewed? What Never. What, what peer review? By who? By Wellington Water. That's what they used last time. Wellington and Wellington Water. Well, this, the, the, all sorts of information come to us. This is a source of information. Uh, Sean's report would be a source of information. The information that we've just seen tonight is a source of information. And will the council take all of that information into the report? Yes. Of course we will. Yeah. 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 No troubles at all. But Glenn, you might not be happy with my decision because you might not agree with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Glenn, I'm not, to, Glenn, I'm not here to argue on facts here. Otherwise, there's a whole heap of stuff I could talk about what I've seen tonight. Well, in cherry picking information. Okay. The I, think, I think Martin, though, that the Thank you. recommendation from CAP is pretty obvious what it's going to be, isn't it? It's going to, yeah, so th that's certainly, and obviously it doesn't need to be accepted by councils. How has the EWE advocated for managed retreat in the, to CAP? Sorry? Hasn't the EWE advocated for managed retreat to CAP? Do you know Tania? Tania. Ah, uh, well. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about it. All right. Last question, eh? One more question. We have one here, right? This lady, Jip. What has council got to put these notes on our limb reports when things haven't been finalised and without any considerate consultation with us? That's a bit of a point. Do you want to address that? No, don't want to address that. Okay. One more question. No, I'm just waiting here. No, no, no. Hi everybody, my name's Nikki. Um, one's not so much of a question but more of a statement and that is, I'm oh, sorry, that was somebody else from a question actually. <laughs> okay. um, but um, I recently insured my property and one of the um, questions that the broker asked me were, was were any hazards identified on my limb report, which I replied no. Now, from the information I had, that's the, that's the position I was in. However, based on the information I have tonight, there possibly is hazards for which I would imagine if you know, push came to shove, the insurance company could get out of. Um, I am located in Parapalama Beach near the Estuary and a new subdivision that the council have allowed to go through. Um, so it would be very interesting to know how would that subdivision got to go through if it's such an issue. But also the fact that now I'm possibly in a position where I'm not insured because I knew nothing about what was on my limb, which is highly possible that it is on my limb for where I'm located. And, yeah, I'm pissed off. Okay. Well, that's, that's one of the questions, but um, the, thing, the thing being is we all have the opportunity to vote. We all have the opportunity to put our hand up to be voted in. So it's up to us to decide our futures. It's up to us to decide whether we are going to have investment property, whether our investment's going to be safe, whether we trust the modelling. Personally, I don't. So it's up to you. 
there's some uh, pamphlets out there on the table to take, to take photos, send them far and wide to everyone you know in this district. It's really important. And as I say, there are council elections uh, next year. There will be 10 spots up for grabs. One of you or someone you know could take that spot and start working for the community, not against the community. Won't we be talking about the next eight weeks? Yeah. yeah. Come on. Don't worry about the elections yet. No, it's still, it's still a look at the future as well. You say probably do. Go back to what, what, what's going to happen in the next two months? To rescind, cap, and get back to 4.5. Question, what's the answer? Okay, so that's all. Okay, so you're the councils. Spread the word far and wide. You've got the, all the email addresses are on the pamphlets there. You need to lobby. You need to get in touch with as many people as you know and lobby the council, lobby, lobby your government. That won't rescind what has been put in by government. How do we do this at a high level? Because they've already, they've, they've already circumvented democracy. Okay, there, is, there are some changes that CALM has made through a constant pushback we have made a difference. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, Councillor Halliday here has followed us around from every, for every single meeting that we've been to. He has been there writing notes. He never, ever supports us. Never. And I just want to ask why. <laughs> I, exactly what I said. But I have no... Of okay, but we have been asking the councillors to help us. And now I'm being demonised by this. Oh, poor Martin. Oh.